You're listening to Rhett Read Podcast. I'm Anna. I'm Serge. And we're here to talk about books we've read. Hope you enjoy! Hey, Serge! Hey, Anna! It's time to record another episode. Another Rhett Read episode, and this time we are talking about the stepsister. Well, before we start talking about the stepsister... Don't forget that we have rando casts coming out at random times talking about random things. They will be coming out, and they are coming out, and they have been coming out. Yep, they're unedited short takes of whatever we feel like talking about. Including movies, shows, books, whatever. Anything we've experienced recently, sometimes we just feel like taking a random take on it, and we put it out there for you guys to listen to. Whether you like it or not. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Hey, Anna, have you read any books recently that you've had a hankering to talk about? I haven't had a really hankering to talk about. I have read books. I finished Spaceman of Bohemia, which we talked about last week. Well, that's right. Yeah. I don't want to spoil it for anyone because it is a book where some of the suspense does add to the intrigue of the book. I'll say that the conclusion did live up to the first half, which I said was very good. Yeah, the first half we mentioned was very apropos of the previous episode which had a revenge theme and hasn't talked to me about the book since then so i'm not really spoiling anything when i say that i have no idea what happens after that but if she's saying it's good you guys should probably take a look yeah going back to the revenge thing how much of our family's sins do we carry how much of life is determined by who is in our lives how long can you blame someone for something that has happened and that's a theme that we'll also see in fear street the stepsister but what this book also deals with is love you know in independence day david's father is talking to david's ex-wife and she said that love was never the problem this book also kind of touches on that where if you have a lot of love in a relationship is love all you need that's a good point wasn't his name steve I thought his name was Steve. Maybe I'm wrong. Jeff Goldblum's character? Yeah. David. Oh, David. Yeah. Uh, Okay, maybe I'm wrong. Okay, Steve. Steve was uh, Captain Steve Hiller, which uh, that was Will Smith's character. Oh, okay. I thought they were both named Steve. My bad. Another issue it dealt with was the life in Czechoslovakia back in Soviet times versus after the Soviet Union collapsed and it became a more democratic society. It makes you question, was life better under one system of government than the other? We are taught in school about how you know once the soviet union fell democracy capitalism ruled and life was so much better for all these countries now that the soviet union was no longer in charge but if you look at how jacob's life in a lot of ways was better under the soviet regime basically based on what his dad did and to the soviet union fell you saw how much his life had fallen apart and then how he had to build himself up but even in his adult life after his childhood issues are long in the past is his life much better than it used to be i mean doesn't he end up in space yes he becomes the spaceman of bohemia could the soviet union have sent him into outer space they had a space program that's true they did send the first man into space did they not actually the anniversary of that was a couple of days ago wow how, Yuri Gagarin. S- how significant that's very interesting anyway Moving on. Another book that I'm currently reading is called Pilot X. It's by Tom Merritt. And the publication date for that will be March 14th. So that should be after this podcast is released. So I got this arc from NetGalley. So thanks to the publisher and NetGalley for that. I'm still maybe about 25% of the way through. It's an interesting book. It's about time travel. It's about an alien species that has the ability to time travel. And Pilot X, you meet him very early on. He's the last remaining survivor of his civilization that had to basically kill themselves for some reason that I haven't gotten to yet. And what has happened is that he needs to get sanctuary in a place where he had talked to these people in the previous timeline. But now that that timeline is gone, they have no clue who he is or what his people are. His people are like, the fairy tale why we don't mess with time travel thing so when he says i am pilot x from this group of people they're all like but it's just a fairy tale what's going on but then they look in their logs and they see that in their computers there's still some things of yes this guy was supposed to come and yet it was signed by the leader of this world and they're just like really confused that sounds fascinating an interesting story like Space of Bohemia, I do have a problem with the writing style. So Space of Bohemia, the problem was that it was way too overwrought. 
I feel like he wanted you to know that he could write and it was flowery and ornate and it was overly philosophical. I mean, there is a place for books like that. You can read books by, you know, someone like Kafka where they try to delve deep into someone's psyche or even Dostoevsky where the character does something that he thinks about and how it relates to this and that and all the metaphors that come about. But the way this guy does it, he like really hammered it in for you. So what Yaroslav Koffer doesn't do as well as people like Kafka or Dostoevsky is that it's so beaten over your head where you just want to read the story, but he's too busy trying to get his point across that you've already gotten the point, but he's still trying to get it to you and you just get frustrated while reading it. I feel like Pilot X has similar issues where he's not overwrought in his writing style. The problem I have with his writing style is that I feel like I'm reading a book written for someone maybe younger than I am. Maybe I would have liked it more as a teenager. It's this very casual writing style that I just want to read the story and it's given to me in a way that I can't really describe. How does this compare to Last Machine in the solar system? What do you, do you mean in terms of writing style? Right, because in Last Machine, obviously the narrator's voice is very pretentious and has sort of what you're talking about right now. So The Last Machine in the Solar System, I would actually compare more with Spaceman of Bohemia. That's more in terms of what that writing style is like. Kind of heavy-handed, deeply philosophical, trying to be a lot more and kind of droning on a bit. Whereas Pilot X is very casual. It sort of reminds me of, actually kind of reminds me of some middle grade fiction in a way. I mean, the topic itself is not towards middle grade fiction type things, but the writing style is very, very casual. And I can see people who like deeper books to maybe not enjoy it, but it might appeal to the crowd of, let's say, Ready Player One or something, but it doesn't have the references that those people tend to like. So I would say if you liked Ready Player One or maybe The Martian, which is also sort of casual and fun, you might like Pilot X. But as I said, I'm only 25% of the way into the book, got 75% left, so who knows what happens. Yeah, you guys will probably hear the final verdict in our upcoming Red Read podcast. And on that note, after this intermission, we are going to talk about Theater Street, the stepsister. That's the end of the intermission. So we should talk about our prediction accuracy. Now, first of all, Let's start with me. I had a pitiful prediction accuracy. I decided that Emily is going to read Jesse's diary. Well, no shit. That's right on the cover. Obviously, that's what happens. The only difference between the cover and what actually happens is that Jesse doesn't technically ever catch Emily reading her diary. I predicted that the stepsister would be involved with something that leads to someone getting murdered. That is very vague. And in the most vague sense, I was technically maybe correct, but in the end, not that much. And it was much closer. I also said that someone would get murdered via strangulation by a male, and that was patently incorrect. Anna, your predictions. So I also said that Emily would read Jesse's diary because, hey, it's on the cover. I also said that the stepsister was involved with something, and like Serge took kind of credit for that, I'll take kind of credit for that. Mm -hmm. But I said it was a female murderer. Yeah. And she technically wasn't a murderer, so I kind of am wrong. But it was a female who was trying to kill someone. And I said there would be a stabbing, but 40% chance not with a knife. Yeah. And... You were really good because, first of all, somebody got stabbed with a knife. And it was not a human being, but that was a murder. And then secondly, somebody got stabbed with not a knife. And that was a human being. That was an attempted murder. And it was done by a female, so you get really big props for this one. You definitely pulled out all the stops and got the mad awesome prediction accuracy. I do believe you got the 100% prediction accuracy at this point. I do have to thank you for that because I was going to use strangulation, but because you made the prediction of strangulation first, I couldn't say it. So that's why I chose knife. You're welcome. You're welcome. We just watched Moana, guys. Moana is a really good movie, and we would have definitely given it a shout out in the previous section, but it's not our thing, so we won't. Let's go on to the plot synopsis of The Stepsister, not Moana. Chapter titles. This is the first time, as far as I know, that we have chapter titles in the Feature Street series. Normally, they just have a number of the chapter, and then it just moves in, but now... 
you have the number and off to the right hand side, you have a chapter title. I found that really distracting. It basically, you didn't need to read the actual chapters. Yeah, it does give a little bit of a giveaway right off the bat. You kind of know what might be happening if you've been paying attention up to that point. Yeah, I would say if you read the first two chapters and then read the chapter titles from then on, you could probably just get the book. You wouldn't get the details, but you would know what would happen. Right. So the story takes place in December. Basically what happens is Emily and Nancy's mom got married to Hugh back in the day, like what, three months ago. And now their step siblings are finally moving in with them on Fear Street. Emily has to live in a room with her stepsister, Jesse, and weird stuff keeps happening. She almost gets killed a few times. Some of the things she loves gets destroyed, and it's a cluster cuss. Yeah, it definitely is. Definitely Emily and Jesse are off to a rocky start. That is a hell of a rocky start. In the last episode, I actually talked about The Babysitter's Club, book 31, Dawn and the Wicked Stepsister, and this book was pretty similar to that. I mean, there was no murder in that one, but the stepsister is not getting along and both sets of parents trying to be more on the side of their stepchild pretty much was in both books. Yeah, I, th- I thought you were pretty spot on with that prediction in the last episode. Even though I've never read any Babysitter's Club episodes, it felt true to what you said. Book. Now, why don't we talk about the first character, Emily Casey. When you're introduced to her, she is described as having shredded wheat hair even though she's never had shredded wheat she's not fat but she loves complaining about how fat she is she complains about her large hands typical teenager going through issues of do i fit in with our friend group blah 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 am i popular enough that kind of thing the weird thing about her is that she's dating her sister's ex-boyfriend yeah we saw in the halloween party that dating your best friend's ex girlfriend was not working out so dating your sister's ex-boyfriend that's not gonna work out either that's probably a terrible idea emily why would you do that listen guys i'll just give you a pro tip even if your sister says that she broke up with him and she's not into him anymore dating him is not a good idea Don't do it. Now, let's move on to her mom. Her mom's a nervous baker. She bakes a lot when she's nervous. Yeah. Makes cake, makes macaroni, casserole, all the stuff. Guys, let's put our differences aside and just eat. Why can't we all just get along? That's her mom's motto. But didn't they say that her food didn't taste great when she makes it nervously? (laughs) So when they said, oh, mom must be nervous. She's making cakes. And they're like, oh, it's going to taste like cement. (laughs) So that's why. That's probably why they're not getting along because their mom is so nervous. And the food just does not taste good. Right. And let's move on to their dad. So their dad is dead. So their mom remarried three months ago to Hugh Warner, who we'll get into later when we talk about Jesse. But their former dad, who's passed away, was a pediatrician, and he was an avid reader. He seemed like a really swell guy. Yeah, he would read two or three books every week and then have like a book talk with his daughters about the books. And they were really into that, and they all had a great time. But the other thing he was into was camping trips, family camping trips. What happened was they went on a family trip out to Fear Island. They set up their tent, they did their thing, but they also took their boat out there. And what happened was he took Emily for a boat ride. After they set up the tent, they set up the camp. He's like, hey, Emily, would you like to go for a boat ride with me? And she was like, okay. And they went for a boat ride and got hit by a wave. The boat capsized. And that was that. They were both thrown off the boat. The boat got turned over. She swam for the boat. She survived. She sees her dad's corpse float by. I guess he just got knocked unconscious and he just never came up in time. Neither one of them were wearing life jackets. And guys, please, when you're out on the water, wear a life jacket. Yeah, in our state, it's actually a law to wear your life jacket. Even if that's not the case where you live, it's a really good idea. You should really wear a PFD or life jacket when you're out there boating. It's very tragic what happened. He was a really loving, caring dad. And Emily and her sister, older sister, 
Nancy really loved him. Their lives were basically changed forever after he died because their mom, they considered her almost childish in many ways. Apparently Emily and Nancy basically had to do everything for their dad's funeral and burial and everything because their mom just couldn't handle it at all. That's right. She was considered to be the child in the family. They had to step up and be the adults in that situation. Which is really tough on Emily because she was there to witness the death of her father and she still had to step up. And honestly, she handled it really well, all things considered. Emily's best friend is Kathy. But the thing about Kathy is she is constantly running off to meet characters from previous books. At one point, she says, oh, hey, there's Della. I need to talk to Della about this. And at another point, she goes, hey, that's Lisa Bloom. I need to go talk to her about that. I had a kick out of that. <laughs> it's like she only existed to let you know that this book ties in with the rest of the books in the series. As soon as you mentioned Lisa Bloom. <sighs> I knew this would happen. Right. So this has to be mentioned. I have to really pound my chest. And really make a point of this because guess what? Lisa is still with Corey. And they're inseparable. Apparently they're a really good couple. It's true that Corey has not been mentioned in the last few books. And apparently what we can infer from this is they went through a rough spot. But I think what happened here is that Corey really matured and now they've really bonded and become a good couple. I think you're reading too much into that. But I will say that congrats on getting that couple right. Moving on to Emily's sister, Nancy. We get an introduction right off the bat. She seems to be really stressed out about having to study a lot. She's trying to graduate from high school and she's focusing on getting into her college. She's always complaining about just how much she has to study, how much work she has to put into a schoolwork. Emily doesn't really believe that it's as much work. At one point actually says that, hey, she spends more time complaining about how much work she has to do rather than having to do the work. That's one thing. The other thing is that apparently she drives a Corsica. What's a Corsica? I don't know. I have to admit, I have a little bit lost interest in the whole car thing. And so at this point in the podcast, I haven't done any research whatsoever into the kind of cars people drive and I don't really care. Admit it, you're only, you only don't care because it's not a Subaru. Right, so Anna's absolutely correct. The mention of the Subaru in the overnight really sparked my interest, and now I've really cooled down. Anyway, we're talking about Nancy, and the feeling you get is she never got over her boyfriend getting stolen by her sister, and yeah, obviously, no shit, she didn't get over her boyfriend getting stolen by her sister. She's the one that broke up with that relationship. Apparently, he was also going to break up as well, but maybe it was the other way around. Did he break up first? I think he broke up first, but she was actually complaining to Emily that she was going to break up with him anyway, but he just did it first. The entire book, he feels a little bit guilty about that, but be that as it may, that relationship was never going to work out anyway, but she still blames Emily for it. Throughout the book, she's constantly supposed to be going on dates with people and then they cancel on her. So she does not have any success in her love life whatsoever. She just can't get a date to the dance. She can't get a date to anything. And she's complaining to her sister about that. The other thing that happened was she kind of holds a grudge against her sister regarding her father's death because Emily was on that boat with her dad when they both went down. This is actually the plot of a Netflix show called Bloodline where the older brother takes the younger sister out on a boat and she dies and everyone blames the brother for that. I got a kick out of that. It's a great show, guys. It has Coach Taylor from Friday Night Lights in it. You should watch it. It's only three seasons. All right, now next up, we got Jessie. Jessie is the stepsister. What happens is the mom remarries and the new dad has a daughter and a son and they're moving in with him. They're moving into the house and the daughter is Jessie. She's described as tiny and petite with pale blue eyes and a whispery voice. And she's very polite around the adults, but as soon as she's alone with Emily, she gets two-faced and becomes kind of a bitch. I don't know if it's just because she's nervous or that's just her personality, but she's not very considerate. That's how I would describe it. She's not considerate. She decides that she wants her bed to be in a certain place, and that's not where it had been determined prior to that, and she doesn't care. That's my bed. She wants to get the dresser in a certain place, and she wants to get the nightstand to be hers, even though there's only one nightstand, and it's supposed to be the other sister's. Doesn't matter. That's my nightstand. 
I do have to say that the part where she complains about the bed placement, that is kind of important. And that should have been discussed with her before she came. They should have just asked, hey, would you prefer the bed by the window or by the door? Right. And that's on the parents, I have to say. But for her to just say, that's my bed, that's my nightstand, and I'm moving it without giving Emily any chance to say anything. It's a weird situation because you're forced into a room with a stepsister. You do actually have to establish some dominance if you don't want to be the total bottom and just completely eat it the entire way. And so maybe that's what she's trying to do. But she does come off a little bit inconsiderate well, in I the mean, first little bit. Yeah, so in one way you could say that, well, maybe she's just a strong-willed woman and that would be fine. The real issue is when the dog comes into the picture and she shoves the dog, she kicks the dog. That's sort of a red flag. Yes, so we... Like dogs, we think dogs are cute, little cuddly creatures that should be adored. And Jessie doesn't agree with us. And so therefore, that throws up a red flag for us. We go, whoa, she doesn't like dogs? What's wrong with her? That's the first sign that you get in this book that's like, maybe you should start suspecting her of not being completely all there. And there's some other signs along the way. Like, for example, you get to find out that she actually has to be in counseling for some kind of, you know, psychological issue that she has. Yeah, two times a week, she needs to see a psychiatrist. Right. And so now that's starting to reinforce your preconceived beliefs like, oh, she doesn't like dogs and she has to have psychiatric help. Well, I have an oh, issue with know. that because that makes people who see, you know, mental health counselors, that plays into the whole stigma that we really want to get rid of. So for me, when they said, oh, she sees a psychiatrist or a therapist twice a week, I just went, oh, oh, okay, that's fine. But then Emily's reaction was, oh my gosh, she must be crazy. And that just kind of bothered me because that really is not what we want. And we do find out later in the book why she needs the therapist help. She did go through a very traumatic experience and it makes sense why she might need a counselor to work her way through what happened but obviously emily doesn't know about that she's just jumping to conclusions well, at this point so many things have happened to emily to the point where any little tidbit about jesse is like oh my gosh she's evil so now let's talk about rich is jesse's brother he's 13 years old and he's basically a really quiet kid he walks around with a book all the time so he's currently reading pet cemetery by Steve. Stephen King, and that's his walk around book. Yep. His dad is really upset because he doesn't believe in reading in general, but he doesn't understand why his son reads. He doesn't understand why his son doesn't speak. He's very upset because his son's reading is not a signed reading from school. He's reading for his own pleasure, and that confuses him. Right. He doesn't understand the concept of reading for pleasure. In fact, he brags that he has not read a book since he graduated from high school. The dad, Hugh Warner, is not the best character ever. But Rich has his issues. He gets caught shoplifting. He gets in fight in schools. But the thing is, he just doesn't speak and... You never really get anything about him, like his psyche or anything. You never figure out or understand him as a character. You just know that after reading Pet Cemetery, he moves on to the Hardy Boys, which is a kind of a weird move. It is weird, and you're supposed to believe that he's a weirdo, and he's supposed to be out there as a possible suspect for all the weird stuff going right, on. Right, because he's reading Pet Cemetery. Right, supposedly. Which is a great book. Which Nancy has read. We already mentioned Hugh Walner. He's, he's the new dad. He's a furniture factory manager, and he's also kind of a sexist at one point he refers to his two stepdaughters his daughter and his wife as his harem which is really weird i did not see the sexism and then i read that line and i was like what? Well, at one point very early on in the book he said the great part of living in a house with four women is that he doesn't need to do any housework yeah that's a little sexist it's weird it's not really correct he does end up doing a lot of the housework, though. In the end, like, for example, spoiler alert, when the dog is killed, he cleans up. He wipes up all the blood. He does all the cleanup for that. He doesn't just say, like, wife, do this. He's not really a bad guy. He says really dumb stuff, but I think he's just dumb and he was brought up in that kind of environment. But I think 
he's an okay guy at heart. Yes, he's not a monster is what Serge is saying. But <laughs> do we applaud people for not being monsters? I don't know. He's doing the best he can. And obviously the mother really needed somebody to be there for her. And, and he was there for her. So I don't blame him for anything that happens. I think he's just doing his best. And he's just not coming from the right place. But he's doing the best that he can from that wrong direction that he has. I'm going to give him that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, Jesse's best friend from before she came to Shadyside was Deborah, but the friend she makes when she moves to Shadyside is Krista, who is the only girl in Shadyside that Emily actually hates. So good job, Jesse. <laughs> this girl can just do no right in Emily's eyes, no matter what she does. Oops. And she also has a secret boyfriend who Emily doesn't know about. That's a big thing that comes in later. Darren, I think his name is. So the thing is, she doesn't want to tell anybody about him because obviously her dad is... A giant stick in the mud. Well, he's three years older than she is, and that's the dad's biggest issue. Right. And then there was all the other issues where her dad suspects her of being a total psycho. Do we want to talk about Jesse's issues right now? No, let's move on to Josh. Josh is Emily's boyfriend. As we mentioned earlier, he was also Nancy's boyfriend prior to that. This guy... Gets around that family. Yeah, I don't know what he's even doing. Apparently, he's short and energetic, I guess. And he used to date Nancy. We already met, went into that. Yeah, there's not much to his character aside from the fact that he dated the two girls. Can we get into the in-depth plot now? Because I really want to talk about the in-depth plot. Okay, let's do this. So the reveal is, spoiler alert... The person who's trying to kill Emily at every chance. I mean, can we talk about all the things that happened to Emily? First of all, they move in. And at the very beginning, when she first brings Jesse into her room, Jesse picks up her favorite teddy bear and rips his head off. Rips it right off. And Emily is just like, that was the teddy bear I got when I was born. What is going on? And Jesse's like, I mean, he's old, so his head was just really loose. I mean, you believe me, right? It was just an accident, she you, says. You believe it's just an accident, right? And Emily is just like, um, okay. Yeah, so she tries to make peace, but she doesn't really believe it. it's an accident. Then the next day at dinner, Jesse comes down to dinner. She's wearing what Emily thinks is her sweater, and she accuses her... How dare you wear my sweater? It's my sweater. Dur, 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 dur. And Jesse goes, no, it's my sweater. And Emily goes, no, but I'm bigger than you. See how big it is on you? It's obviously my sweater. Why would you buy a sweater that's too big? And Jesse goes, well, I like having a nice, comfy, loose sweater. And Emily goes upstairs. And she doesn't see her sweater in her drawer. And she goes, Jesse stole my sweater. How dare she do that? Then she finishes her essay and goes downstairs to get a snack. This is interesting because she actually types it up on the computer. I guess we'll mention this in 90s things later on. She goes downstairs to get a snack. She comes back. And there Jesse is sitting at the computer with the DOS prompt just flashing there her essay's gone so the thing is emily has written about 14 pages and spent days on this paper so it's not something that she can just rewrite overnight she did a lot of research so she sees that it's gone and jesse goes i don't know what you're talking about emily like just gets that red haze over her eyes <laughs> And she just, just attacks Jesse. She goes right for the throat, just pounds her in the face with her fists, nails her down to the floor, fists flying, bam, bam, bam. Just sucker punches her. Jesse doesn't see this coming, gets the crap beaten out of her. Her parents rush in. What's going on? I'm surprised at this point they don't go, maybe you guys should split up into different rooms. Right. But no, it doesn't happen. Nope. You know, eventually Emily's just like, oh, okay, I'll deal with Jesse. And they have this really amazing sister scene with Nancy, Jesse, and Emily. But they have that whipped cream fight. The whipped cream fight was amazing. It's finally where Emily and Jesse realize that they're actually kindred spirits. They have this really cute whipped cream fight where they spray whipped cream at each other. And they just have a great old yeah, time. Nancy comes and enjoys them. They're all spraying whipped cream. And they're eating it and licking like the whipped cream off everything. It's all great and happy. And Jesse says, hey, I'll go clean up why don't you go shower first and then emily goes upstairs she showers and all of a sudden turns out somebody put peroxide in her shampoo and she's got freaking blonde streaks through her hair which she's already super sensitive about so obviously she blames jesse for that because nancy says i saw jesse in the bathroom for like 20 minutes Actually, she doesn't know who to blame. Nancy's the one that first blames Jesse about it. And the dad thinks 
Maybe it's the son. Because he thinks his son is a freak. The dad is like got really issues with his son being a reader. So he's blaming his son at this point. Later that night, the son sneaks into their room, wakes Emily up and whispers in her ear, It wasn't me! She's like really freaked out, but she's also half asleep. So she's just like, okay, whatever. Just go away. I believe you and goes back to sleep. So things are already kind of frosty in this house. Right. And then the dog dies. Emily has a really nice night out with Josh and she comes home, goes in the kitchen and there is the family dog with a knife shoved into it, blood everywhere. She screams horrified. The entire family comes down and they just walk in on this dead dog. Right, so you missed one thing. The knife is actually not there. Oh shit, yes. They find the knife later in Jesse's drawer. Yeah, so the the dog has obviously been stabbed to death. It has clear stab wounds and it's bled to death and it's in the kitchen and there's a puddle of blood around it. The knife, which is the murder weapon, is not there and is found later on. It is found in Jesse's drawer. Once again, we're supposed to suspect Jesse. Next day, the dog ends up in... Emily's backpack. She goes to uh, Saturday, like, extracurricular class on typing and... She opens her backpack to take out her notes and there's the dead dog is in her backpack. It's freaking nuts. Yeah, I mean, listen, you kill a dog, you're an asshole. You take the dog's corpse and you mess with someone like that? No. You've crossed every single line. You're basically on a one-way road to mass murder. Pretty much at this point, based on any psychological profiling you've ever read by the FBI or whatever, if you start out down this path, you're going to become a serial killer. This is basically it, kids. This is how it happens. You start out murdering innocent animals and framing other people for it, sticking them in backpacks to hurt people. You're messed up and you're going to move on to murdering other people. And guess what happens in this book? That person that murdered that puppy is going to move on to murdering people. So Emily's on full blown. This is Jesse. Oh my gosh, she's crazy. The mom is too childish and doesn't like confrontation and talking about problems to deal with it. So she and Nancy basically go through Jesse's stuff. Emily finds Jesse's diary. She starts reading Jesse's diary. She reads about Jolie. Emily finds out that actually Jesse had a best friend. And then what happened was, quote unquote, she fell down and died accident but nobody believed jesse because she was the one found in the crime scene quote-unquote crime scene and everyone thought that she had actually pushed her because they had an argument before the death and before that emily wakes up in the middle of the night to find jesse on the phone talking to someone and one of the things she says is i could kill her that's something people just say, given when, the context of everything. When you start adding things up, that does go on the list of, oh no. Right, and then another time she wakes up and she notices Jesse isn't in her bed, and the window's open and she somehow snuck out. Yeah, by the way, wouldn't you think that she'd want the bed next to the window if she's going to be sneaking out? But just because you want to sneak out doesn't mean you want that breeze. Maybe she's not sneaking out through the window. I would assume you'd be sneaking out through the window, maybe not though. Have you ever tried to sneak out of a house through a window? No. Okay. I have not tried to sneak out of a house through a window. That seems like a terrible idea unless you're on the first floor. Uh, so there's another scene where Krista in the lunchroom confronts Emily and goes, Why don't you like Jesse? She just tries so hard and you're so mean to her and you treat her so badly. And Emily gets some food on her. She's like, I don't want to deal with this. This is so stupid. And she's like, I need to clean myself off. And Krista's just like, Why can't you be nice to Jesse? Why can't you be nice? As Emily's walking out and she's walking to the bathroom. She walks smack dab into Jesse, who is just crying. And she looks at her and goes, why don't you give me a chance? Why are you poisoning the parents against me? What are you trying to do? And Emily's just like, I don't, this is, how do I run into both of them? This is where you really start to feel for Jesse. From the beginning, you're thinking, after the initial bad start they get, Jessie doesn't actually visibly do any bad things, right? Yeah, after they find the dog, she actually draws a nice bubble bath for Emily. But because Emily's already so paranoid at this point, she thinks that maybe Jessie put poison or something in the water, so she refuses to go in. So you can see that Jessie is trying so hard to try to smooth things over. Jessie's doing her best. 
After Emily finds the dead dog in her backpack, she gives Jesse the silent treatment. And this is what really breaks Jesse's mind. This is what causes her to start crying in the school bathrooms and just completely lose it. Maybe Jesse's not the best person. Maybe he's kind of like a tough girl that wants to establish dominance. But she breaks down at the silent treatment. The silent treatment breaks her for sure. She can't even handle it. This is your first school that like... Maybe she's not the hardened puppy killer that you think she might be. If she's breaking down at the silent treatment stage of things, she's probably not that bad of a person. Well, it's not just the silent treatment thing that she's breaking down from. She's being accused of murdering a dog. I think that's what she's breaking down from. The very idea that someone could think that she's a dog murderer I... and that her family maybe doesn't believe her and that this whole Jolie thing is following her for the rest of her life and she'll always be seen as someone who could commit commit heinous crimes. I think in her mind, she's actually trying to pretend she's not being accused of it. She's trying to block it out and pretend like she doesn't know why she's being given the silent treatment because she doesn't even want to contemplate the idea of being accused of that because that's such a heinous thing that she couldn't even comprehend doing. She maybe didn't like that dog, but she would never in the wildest dreams imagine... Stabbing the dog (laughs) repeatedly. Yeah, She doesn't even know about the backpack thing, but I'm sure she wouldn't even imagine doing that either. And so she's blocking that out, consciously blocking that out and trying to figure out like, why am I being given this answer? Because she's so confused. She doesn't even want to even comprehend the reason why she might be being given this answer. So anyways, after Jessie leaves the bathroom and Emily is cleaning herself off, she realizes the bathroom is on fire. And someone has put a doorstop underneath the door on the other side. So she can't leave this bathroom that is burning down. So because Jessie was the last person in the bathroom that she knows of, once again, Jessie is to blame over this incident. And this is very serious. Emily almost dies. The only reason she doesn't is because a teacher is doing sort of a sweep of the school once the fire alarm goes off to make sure nobody's anywhere. And she notices that the door's been stopped up. No, she doesn't even notice that because what happens is Emily is pounding on the door like, help me, help me, get me out. Once the teacher gets her out of the bathroom, the teacher goes, oh, I need to ring the alarm now. You read about her going to the alarm, lifting the glass and setting the alarm off. So this school's fire alarm system is so bad that Emily could have died and no one would have known about the fire. I thought this school was well funded. Yeah, suddenly we learn otherwise. I have a feeling there's a couple of other things in this book where we decide that this school is not as well funded as we thought it was. It slipped my mind because it's been like two days since I read this book. We did actually kind of drag our feet on this recording session, unfortunately. Listen, we had a really cool climbing comp and Alex Puccio was there. And those in the bouldering community, you all know who Alex Puccio is. Yeah, we got a signed poster and also we got a signed picture of the two of us with Alex Puccio. Which was totally rad. No regrets. No regrets here. She's 10-time ABS climbing champ. Motoring champ, is she not? She totally owned the comp. She flashed every problem. Oshima wasn't there this time. (laughs) It was the Tri-State Bouldering Comp. And last year, Oshima won it. But this year, they had it the same day as SCS Nationals. So... I gotta tell you, though. Last year, Puccio was battling injuries. I bet this year, it would have been a real battle had Oshima, you know, had the guts to show up. Oshima won SCS Nationals. Uh Puccio beat Oshima at the bouldering comp prior to that. But now Oshima can climb and represent the U.S. in the World Cups for climbing as well as bouldering. Yay, Oshima can now join the World Cup stage and we're super psyched, but we are so off topic. Shady side, poorly funded. (laughs) Right. Anyway, so what happens at the end? is that her stepfather decides he's going to take everybody on a camping trip. Maybe he's just trying to fill the shoes of the original father. He basically says, you know what? We need to become a family and things aren't working out right now. I got a bonus so we can take a week and go to South Carolina and go camping. So they take a plane to South Carolina, which means they're not within driving distance, which once again supports my theory that maybe they're in Ohio. Yeah, because they said it's too cold up here. Let's fly down somewhere warm. They go to South Carolina and they go on a 
pretty cool backpacking camping trip, which I appreciate. You know, they have to hike into the campsite. They have to have their tents and everything in their backpacks. And once they get there, it's pretty late. And they have to gather the firewood to uh, get the campfire going, get the cooking going. I'm sure their dad is really old-fashioned. He was going to want to cook on the campfire. And this is where things turn batshit crazy. So all three girls are sent out to collect firewood. The parents and the brother are left to set up camp. And so what happens is they all get separated. Emily stumbles upon, I guess, a graveyard. And out of nowhere, somebody knocks her into a grave. And she's trying to scramble out of there. And the shovel keeps, like, hitting her hand. Her arm is broken by the shovel. Basically, somebody stabs her in the arm with a shovel. Her arm is broken. She's bleeding from, like, a shovel stab wound. She's at the bottom of the grave. And she's screaming, Jesse. Stop it. Basically, the person that's done that to her starts throwing dirt onto her and burying her alive now at this point. And she gets a good look, and it's Nancy. And now everything that the reader has probably suspected all along up to this point becomes clear to Emily. Her sister glared down at her, her features frozen in grim determination, her eyes wild with hatred. Nancy, it's you? Emily suddenly felt so confused, her fear mixed with hurt and surprise. Holding the shovel in both hands, Nancy raised it high above her head. Then you get some parts with Emily just going, Nancy, what's going on? Finally, Nancy broke the pose. I hate you, Emily. She called down, her features cold, expressionless. But Nancy, why? Nancy, still holding the shovel high, loomed menacingly above Emily, looking like a statue. A graveyard monument. Why, Nancy? You killed Daddy! Nancy shrieked. She swung the shovel down with both hands. You killed Daddy! You killed Daddy! You killed Daddy! You killed Daddy! You could have done something. You could have saved him. But you saved yourself instead. You could have saved him. You lived and he didn't. You took away the only two men I ever cared about. Daddy and Josh. You took them both away. Yeah, so this is where you figure out that Nancy's completely lost it. If you haven't figured it up till now, you know it at this point. She needs some help. But first of all, before that can happen, Emily really needs some help. And guess who comes to the rescue? Jesse. Jesse comes in. She saves the day. She knocks Nancy out of the picture, helps Emily out of the gravesite, and alerts the parents. Everything is resolved. Nancy's going to get some psychiatric help that she needs. And Emily and Jesse get a chance to actually bond and talk in a way that they haven't been able to before. And Emily hears about Jesse's story about Jolie and what actually happened, and also Jesse's boyfriend. Right, so the reason she's been sneaking out in the middle of the night is because she has this boyfriend that her dad doesn't approve of her. She has to sneak away to see him. She has to have those phone conversations that are secretly happening in the middle of the night. That's what's happening. It has nothing to do with Emily. It has no nefarious plot whatsoever. She just has a boyfriend her dad doesn't approve of. That's basically it. Yeah, she basically says that she's so nervous about having to hide the boyfriend and having this whole thing with Jolie hanging over her head. And on top of that, moving to a new school, moving in to share a room with someone that she doesn't really know. The stress of everything, it gives her a different personality in a way that she didn't think. And now she's being blamed of all these heinous things. So it kind of drives her to a different emotional place as well. Yeah, so she's not as bad as she comes off. That's her excuse. Listen, I got all these things going on in my life. Even though I ripped the head off your teddy bear and didn't like the dog to begin with, doesn't mean I'm an evil murdering person. And Emily recognizes that and they actually end up getting along quite well. Which you saw in the... The whipped cream scene. Exactly. You knew that they were like actually kind of kindred spirits, capable of getting along quite well. It was just something else there that was driving them apart. Nancy. (laughs) Nancy. Who had lost her mind. Which is also understandable. You can't blame her. She lost her father. She lost everything. Her whole childhood was just thrown into shambles by that tragic, tragic accident out on Fear Island. Fear Lake. We can't blame her either. It's just one of those things. No, you can't blame her. You're right. You blame the mom. The mom, it sounds like, wasn't really there for the children after... But, you know, you can't really blame the mom either. She lost her husband, who she loved very much. It was just a giant tragedy all around. Let's just say that. Let's move on to the nitpicks. Yeah, they had homecoming in December. 
That's weird. Well, what I thought was weird was the fact that, so the kids are coming in December, right? Jesse and Rich come to live with them in December. They don't talk about the holidays. They didn't talk about Thanksgiving that probably just happened. And they obviously didn't spend any time with their step-siblings during Thanksgiving. They don't talk about Christmas. I mean, Christmas is around this time, right? They don't talk about any holiday plans that never comes up school break for winter that doesn't come up it seems like it's december but it's not really december that's true so it did come off weird it's like well if it's homecoming shouldn't that be earlier in the year it should be october at the latest but we just had the halloween party so they didn't want to go backwards so november would work it just felt weird that it was supposed to be december yeah maybe they were just very secular and didn't even want to talk about christmas who knows it's also really weird that Hugh would suggest a family camping trip after what happened with the previous dad where he died on a camping trip. Maybe it would just stir some raw memories that didn't need to happen. And clearly, he even himself admitted he hadn't gone camping there since he was a small child. So he wasn't super attached to that place. But whatever, he I guess he just wanted to bond with everybody. Yes, by calling his children a harem. Yeah. That's not gross or anything. I'm going to just cut him some slack. It just seems like a dumb guy that was just trying to do as best he could with just how dumb he was he was not the smartest person in that book and he was just doing what he could with how little he knew fear street mythos hey so i guess we have a death on fear lake part of the whole thing where people die in the fear street fear lake fear fill in the blank here on the flip side you have these people their house is on fear street and they don't really believe in that whole fear street whole blue about bad things happening i mean she's lived there since she was seven years old i think right and she says that I haven't seen anything. I do hear weird noises at night and weird howling, but other than that, it seems fine. Yeah, so this goes back to something we've seen repeating in the last few books where people living on actual Fear Street don't seem to experience any of the stuff that Corey talks about being reported in the newspaper. So that's something to think about. If the evil corporation was actually really trying to kick people out of their homes there, you'd think they'd actually be doing more than just some newspaper propaganda. Maybe it's a way to keep people, new people away, and the people that have been there a while, they just want them to leave naturally. So maybe it's a thing where they don't want to increase the crime rate and make that place a totally horrible place statistically. But at the same time, once these people leave naturally, new people don't come in. Maybe that's why there's so many empty houses right that's a good point okay so 90s things the computer i remember back in the 90s having to type up reports on the computer you know it was more of an arduous process and perhaps saving and keeping backups was not as obvious as it is these days what do you mean keeping backups when you save papers did you honestly save in two different files Back in the day, like, let's say this is like 1991, your computer could have a floppy disk drive. You could also have a hard drive. So you could save in both places, for instance. Sometimes at this stage of computing, maybe your computer didn't really have a hard drive and you only had floppy disk drives. But what you could do is you could keep multiple floppy disk backups. But would you do that for writing a paper? I mean, you're not writing your thesis or something. This is just a high school report. At the time when I was in elementary school, what I did was I kept all my papers saved on a floppy disk drive. What I would do is if I was done for the day, I would save a copy on the floppy disk drive. So that means what would happen in Emily's scenario is if the computer was turned off, as it happened by Nancy, she would lose the three paragraphs that she didn't type in that day. But she wouldn't lose the entire paper because it would still be saved on a floppy disk. See, I never did that growing up, so that's not something that rang strange with me. I just saved it in one file and kept going. Let's say you saved it. Right, but you're assuming that Nancy didn't go through it and just delete her file. Do you think Nancy did that? Yes. She killed a dog. She put peroxide in her sister's shampoo. She almost set her sister on fire. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she went out of her way to hit the delete button. That is literally the least heinous thing that she had done to her sister at that point yeah if she okay the way my papers were saved if somebody wanted to go and delete all my papers yes it could have been done you're right nancy obviously did that anyway but this is a 90s thing writing a paper on an old ass computer obviously this is like an ms dos computer that the paper was written i remember writing papers in ms dos yeah so you know that's pretty cool i really appreciate the old school computing shout out in this 
book that really struck a chord with me. But people still write reports on their computers now, so he never specified Emma's DOS. No, but he does mention when she comes upstairs, that command prompt is there. Uh. It's just blinking and it clearly indicates to Emily that, oh crap, my word processor has been closed out and my paper is no longer there and it's just the basic command prompt. That's the 90s thing right there. Nobody writes their papers in MS-DOS with some kind of command prompt. Unless you or had a... any operating system with a command prompt for that matter. Don't some Linux operating systems use command prompts? And, and how many high school students do you know that use a Linux command shell to operate their computer in order to write that their papers on my brother did in high school and he was not a normal high schooler so i don't expect many high schoolers to be doing that but yes i do know people who did that right so he went into high school in the early 2000s yes and he still did that okay and he also played with our ms dos computer back in the day in the 2000s as well so right so we're not talking about the ravenclaw guy what's his name henry raven yeah this is not a henry raven here this is emily your question was how many high schoolers do i know and i said that when my brother did that i was merely answering your question that you had posed okay you know i messed around with that stuff in high school too this is not okay fine <laughs> that was not the question you asked Right. Anyways, other 90s things. In the first page of the book, they're reading Sassy Magazine. And I thought, I wonder if Sassy Magazine was a real magazine or our R.L. Stein is inventing something for his world. Okay, did you find out? Yes. Sassy Magazine was an indie rock magazine that was defunct in 1996. But it was like an alternative indie magazine that people really liked. That's so cool. Wow. Good job looking that up. I probably should have looked up the car. Uh, another 90s thing was when Josh and Emily are studying together, he brings a trapper keeper. I remember trapper keepers. Do you remember those? It's just a binder. It has a zipper. What were you thinking when you read the book? Because I think it was pretty early that I figured out it was Nancy. I don't think I 100% knew it was Nancy, but I definitely felt very sympathetic for Jessie. I think R.L. Stein really makes you sympathize for her and feel that she's being treated unfairly throughout. Because past the very first few introductory notes where she does come off a little bit bad, after that there's no evidence that the reader sees that she's actually doing anything untoward or anything bad you begin to immediately sympathize with her because she's clearly being framed for the whole thing so now there's a couple of suspects it could either be a her brother who's a weirdo or it could be b nancy it's not really clear which one it is they both come off as a little bit weird. I think the point where you really begin to decide is where Emily sees somebody making out with her boyfriend in a car in her driveway. That's probably where you think, okay, it's probably not the brother that's making out with her boyfriend at that point. It's probably Nancy. I thought that Nancy's complaints about being a senior were so over the top because senioritis is a term for a reason. You and her, don't have to work that hard, do you? Her complaint, constant complaining about how she doesn't have time to do things it's like oh she's obviously thinking of ways to kill her sister i get it yeah i guess i didn't figure that out i definitely fell for a lot of the red herrings i thought it eh, maybe it's the brother so I, I wasn't decided as to who it was until close to the end i thought the brother was too empty a character for it to be him there wasn't enough to say, hey, it might be the brother. Like, he was so obviously a red herring that I wasn't even considering him anymore. And then the whole Jesse thing just didn't make sense. And it was so obviously Nancy. The way that she was constantly helpful and there and trying to be... That's like, she true. knew everything that was coming from all sides. So she knew the perfect things to say to Emily at the right time. She was definitely manipulating her. The other thing that we mentioned about this is maybe this book should have been called Red Herring. Yeah, Fear Street, Red Herring. And let me tell you, the chapter titles did not help this book. It was an interesting book. I gotta say, it was very much just one thing. It was... Red Herring. That's all it was. How many decapitated teddy bears would you give this book? I would give it a solid one decapitated teddy bear out of five. Yeah, I think I'd give it one decapitated teddy bear out of five. The red herrings didn't work for me. When we talked about Haunted, I said it's fine to know who did what, but it's the why and the how is this happening that's important. I kind of figured all of that out pretty early on, and I was just wondering at what point Nancy would crack. And I knew it would happen in the last 10 or so pages of the book, and I was just like... I've already figured out every single aspect that I'm supposed to figure out. 
And when I got to it, I was like, yep, I was right. I mean, the scene was pretty cool. With Nancy, Jesse, and Emily in the graveyard. But it was probably too late at that point. This could have been a book that would have benefited from being 140 some pages to me. That's true. For me, even, I guess that last scene didn't really rescue it. And also, even though I wasn't completely figuring it out the whole time, I did not enjoy it as much. I did see the whole appeal of the whole family drama unfolding. And I don't regret reading this book. I didn't hate it. But I can't in good conscience recommend it to anybody. The book title didn't lie. It was a stepsister that was bad. It just didn't say whose stepsister. Right. Nancy did cause Jesse a lot of grief as well, if you look at it from that perspective. That's true. That's a good that's a good point. Yeah, you're right. The family drama didn't save it at all. And I think the parents were too weak of a character in general to make the family drama compelling. The mom, obviously, I mean, a lot could have been solved had the mom just sat them down, sat Jesse and Emily down and been like, let's talk individually. Or Hugh could have done something or said something. But they all just sort of went at it without knowing anything. I mean, Jesse wasn't consulted about the type of room she'd want to live in. Emily wasn't told about Jesse. Jesse's past issues, which she might have had an issue with the person living with her possibly killing her best friend. These are all things that people should know that they weren't told. And the fact that the parents were so useless, you're not rooting for anyone at this point. And this book had you rooting for no one. Oh, Emily's almost dying. Okay, but she's kind of not compelling. Nancy was obviously the murderer early on, so you don't give a shit about her. You're a little curious about like Rich, but he's an empty void. Josh is weird. And Jesse, you know, you feel bad for her, but... She did kick and toss the dog, so why would you care? It was not just uncompelling from a family dynamic. You know, this actually, what you've just said to me is triggering a thought in my mind. I think now, looking back on it, this book could have benefited from a final act where Jesse and Emily team up to do something together. Because the heart of the story is that Jesse and Emily are pitted against each other due to their parents' ineptitude at bringing the two families together and due to the fact that their sister Nancy is having a mental breakdown. And so they have to battle these things so that's the conflict. They're battling against their parents that have to do and their sister slash stepsister's craziness. And they overcome it. And that's okay. But what would really, really benefit this book is another act where they are actually now a team working together. And you only see them joining together in the last couple pages. And then you don't see them working together at the end. And maybe that would have worked out. Maybe that would have worked. Because I could see, based on the dad's character and the mom's character, they were obviously never going to make this family join together properly. They were not going to make it work okay. That's just who they are. They're inept people. Fine. The older sister, okay, she's mentally broken. That was going to be a given going into this. So what you really want to see is you want to see the grand conclusion of this and you don't see that you kind of have nancy and emily working together in the way that you're talking about because they did mention oh the parents are inept oh we need to take down Jesse together but even that team work was like what two pages at most even having that as the final act and having the twist that would have worked a lot better had there been more of the nancy emily team there wasn't and that was a bit lacking also emily brought the knife used to kill the dog on the camping trip and there was no payoff for that because she brought it maybe on the off chance that she'd be able to show her parents and there was no payoff to that it's a weird like show and tell does that even work here's the knife that was used to kill the dog like i thought at one point oh I see what's going to happen. They're going to frame Emily for everything that's been happening because it's all been happening to her. So wouldn't it be really smart for Nancy to twist it so that Emily gets blamed for the bleach or peroxide in her shampoo. Oh, Emily gets blamed for stabbing the dog because she is the one that stands over him. And Jesse already has that background in her story. So it's clearly plausible that the person standing over a dead body is the one who committed that crime. So I thought, oh, that's really clever. That's going to be the twist. And there was no twist. By the way, can I just insert a 90s thing here? bringing a bloody knife on the plane i'm assuming she put it in her checked luggage the tsa would never allow such a thing nowadays (laughs) honestly like how was that plan going to work like here's the knife that someone had used and i swear it's jesse like even though i have it no it was jesse and jesse would be like what the hell total bs right it was never gonna work so there were a lot of problems with this book 
Come on, R.L. Stein. We know you can do better. The, well, the thing is, this is a tough plot line. I think he tackled something that's way outside of his scope. Family drama? Yeah. I think this was something he tackled it, you know, good for him, but it's way, way outside of the scope of the Fear Street series. Well, it's pretty unfortunate that he had Rich reading Pet Cemetery by Stephen King, because I think Stephen King would have been able to handle it. That's true. I mean, he did butcher the ending like Stephen King does with his books, so <laughs> that works. Oh, boy. What I liked was the Pet Cemetery reference with the dead animal yeah. in the Pet Cemetery. Yeah, and that, that worked. For me, it didn't work that much because it was kind of like a stretch. Like, why are you accusing this kid just because he read a book? It was kind of like the old trope of, oh, you're playing violent video games, therefore you're going to, you know, shoot up a school, whatever. Like, no, that's not how that works. But that's not what Pet Cemetery. is. But that, again, 90s thing. Well, it's not even just a 90s thing. They still talk about it now. Don't reference a better author in your book if you're not going to write the best book you can. That's true. This is one of the weaker Fear Street series books we've read. And now he's referencing Stephen King, which is a well-established, successful author. Arl Stein. You let us down with this. Yeah. I guess I'm going to cut you some slack because this is not your thing. And if you were going to do this kind of thing, maybe, I don't know, team up with... Do like a crossover with the Babysitter's Club person. I don't know. What? That's their oh, thing. Oh, because it's, it's a drama yeah, type thing. That's their thing. So R.L. Stein and Anna Martin. Collab now. For this book, definitely should have been a collab. Let's do some predictions. So the next book is... Fear Street, Ski Weekend. Oh, man. It was a perfect setting for murder. Well, looking at the cover, it's looking kind of scary because there's a guy with a ski mask on. God forbid someone wears a ski mask to a ski weekend. The kids have their skis and ski boots as they're looking out the window of their cabin out into the mountainside. It looks like a pretty like serious mountain out there, so I guess maybe they flew... Out to somewhere out west to that, go skiing. Where, where, where's the mountain? Right, right out the window. Do you see that? It it's looks a, a tree. It could be trees. No, no, no. Look at that slope. It's a big old mountain slope right there. You see all that stuff? Rocks. That's snow. That's some serious stuff. Anyways, we can make our predictions. It doesn't matter. So, looking at the cover, I think it's a bunch of shady sky side high school kids on a ski weekend. It's a perfect setting for murder. And that is the plot of the book. I think the murder gender is going to be a male. I just got a feeling. The murder weapon, I want to say it's a knife. But I want to make a fun prediction as well. Okay. So my serious prediction is I think it's going to be a guy with a knife. But my fun prediction is I want someone to be killed with a ski pole. My serious one is knife male, but my joke one is a ski pole. So my serious one is hypothermia. I think somebody's going to die of hypothermia. I'm just going to go for murderer male as well. Yeah, ski pole was something on my mind. But somebody might get stabbed with a ski pole, but I don't think they're going to end up dying from it. Let's just put it that way. Let's just say Lisa and Corey might be in this one. Let's just put it that way. Ooh. Yeah, because in the last book... They were established as still being together and actually finally like making that relationship work. So I think we're going to capitalize on that and they're going to be in this book. All right. That's my prediction. Predictions locked. And loaded. All right, guys. Thank you for listening so much. We really appreciate you tuning into this podcast. Thanks for listening. Feel free to comment. All right. Peace out, guys. Have a good night. Thanks for listening to another thrilling episode of Rhett Read Podcast. If you like what you hear, give us a shout out. If not, let us know why in the comments. Don't forget to rate, review, comment, share, like, and subscribe. You can follow us at Red Read Podcast on Twitter and Facebook. Or send suggestions or fan mail to red.read.podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, peace!